Hi, I'm Bill Pollack at MissouriNet.com. Uh, the Royals find themselves down in a 3-2 uh, to two hole here uh, after a 5 nothing loss in Game 5 of the World Series. Now, I- I'm not calling myself a baseball expert at all. These are just my opinions. Uh, if, if I were a baseball expert, I, I wouldn't be sitting here. I would be coaching some team within some organization on some level. Um, but I wanted to set the record straight with some fans and even those in the media who are trying to blame the Game 5 loss on Ned Yost for some of his uh, managing decisions. Uh, they weren't the wrong decisions. They weren't the wrong decisions at all. I, I, I thought... I thought that Yost... Good job. What do we got here? Turn you down a little bit, there, Mister. We're gonna we're gonna mute that guy. He wants to watch in. That's fine. Um, I I thought that there were a couple scenarios that came up in the game where um where, where Ned Yost made the right call. Things just didn't work out. Let me run through these scenarios. Here. We gotta cut you out, man. All right. Let me go through my scenarios here. <laughs> the first uh, has to do with Billy Butler. All right. Butler, the designated hitter. You can't use the designated hitter in the National League ballparks. We know that. The pitcher has to bat for themselves. I saw numerous times fans questioning, begging, screaming for Ned Yost to let Butler bat. But they were all in the wrong situations. And, and I tried to explain this on Twitter, and, and people just, they weren't getting it and they weren't understanding it. So with, with the Royals playing in the National League Park, Billy Butler now becomes Ned Yost's best pinch hitter. Not the first, not necessarily the first pinch hitter that he's going to use, but his best. And Yost said it, and several players said it before the game with, uh, with Butler's bat out of the lineup that he would still have an opportunity to make an impact in one of these three games, maybe all three games. Uh, they said this before going out to San Francisco in late inning situations. Um, here's basically the, the philosophy or the rule. You don't bring up your best bat off the bench when you don't have at least one runner in scoring position. All right. I mean, you, you've got to bring in that guy. And listen, we, and we saw uh, Morse. Uh, we saw him get up and and look like he was going to bat a couple of times in this series, and Bruce Bochy bought him, brought him back in the fifth inning. So th- this philosophy is is pretty solid when it comes to major league teams. I think I'm on with this one. First case, top of the fifth inning, Omar Infante with a one-out double. Gerard Dyson strikes out. You've got two outs, and now the pitcher spot comes up, James Shield. This is where I'm seeing people say, bring Butler in, bring Butler in. Um, you've got the runner in scoring position, but the game is two to nothing. And you've only had your starting pitcher pitch four innings. That's not the right spot to bring in Billy Butler. You have to leave your starting pitcher in there. Yost's hands are tied. He's got to keep his starting pitcher in the game. Unfortunately, with two outs, he strikes out and the inning is over and they leave the runner stranded on second. The second instance where I saw tweets that demanding Butler come in, we're in the seventh inning. Eric Hosmer, a one-out single. Salvador Perez lines out. Now you've got Mike Moustakis, who was 0 for 2, struck out his first time up, lined out to the shortstop. And I saw people, uh, multiple people tweeting saying, bring in Billy Butler. Listen, you do not take your starting third baseman out of the game and replace him with a pinch hitter. Now, Moose is a lefty. Bumgarner's a lefty. I understand that matchup. But what Yost would have to do in that situation is take out your starting third baseman, which you never do, replace him with Butler's bat, then you have to take someone off your bench and replace Moustakis in the field. So you're using two guys to replace your starting third baseman. You don't do that. And even if you consider doing that, you don't have a runner in scoring position at that that point. You still just have a runner on first and two outs. So the odds of Butler doing anything that's going to make that much of an impact where you need to pull your starting third baseman makes absolutely no sense at all. So you get to the eighth inning and who leads off? Billy Butler. Now you're saying to me, Bill, I've been watching your video now for the last couple of minutes and everything that you say flies in against what you're just preaching. Well, all right, two nothing game, no runners in scoring position and Butler leads off. Now I tweeted too fast last night because I was wondering the same thing, what was going on. But Yost made perfect sense with this call. Uh, The inning before Yost made a double switch to get Jason Nix in the game at second base and move him into the number nine spot in the order moving the pitcher spot to seventh, which was the last out of the inning before. So after Knicks, Yost then has the top of his order. And again, you're not going to replace 
your leadoff hitter, your two, three, your cleanup hitter, your number five hitter. You're not going to replace them with Butler. So now time's running out in the game for Yost. He hasn't had the opportunity, hasn't had the right time to bring in Butler. Now he has to bring him in. So he brings him in to pinch it for Dyson. You can use Nori Aoki to fill in for Dyson in the outfield. The point here now is even though there's nobody in scoring position, now you need a better bat. You need a better bat than Dyson. You hope that Butler can get on base. If Butler gets on base, you pinch run with Terrence Gore. Now you see what Knicks can do. Moves up, moves him over. Maybe Gore steals. Whatever the case is, you got somebody in scoring position. Now you're back to the top of the order. It's late inning games. He's got to make the move there and put Billy Butler in at that point. Uh, he ends up looking at strike three, which was about three inches off the plate. But Bumgarner is going to get those calls, so it didn't work out. But absolutely, the the right situations to use Butler and to not use Butler. No fault with Yost at all. Now, I saw one more complaint about the double switch in the, the seventh inning, taking uh, Infante out and putting Herrera in. It's a simple move. You go back to the inning before, Herrera's spot was due up second in the order. So you double switch, the pitcher bats seventh. He's now ninth in the order, and you bring Nix in for Infante at second base. Yost does that so that if Herrera has a relatively easy seventh inning, gets through the seventh inning, which he did, you can come back and have Herrera pitch in the eighth. Now, I had people saying, no, you got you to get Herrera out of there and bring in Wade Davis. Look, you don't use your top two pitchers, two of your top three, really. You don't use Herrera and you don't use Davis when you're down two to nothing. You try to use Herrera, who is used to pitching multiple innings. You try to get him through the seventh and the eighth. If the Royals somehow manage to tie the game by having Billy Butler come up and you, you get a rally going in the eighth inning, um, you have Herrera try to finish off the eighth. You have Wade Davis then potentially in a tie game in the ninth inning. And that's where you want to save your premier pitchers when it matters. You don't want to have to use two premier pitchers when you're down two to nothing. Now, it backfires. Herrera doesn't get his job done. He gives up the first two singles to start the eighth inning. Now, Yost has to go into panic mode. So now he's got to bring in Wade Davis, and Davis gets hit. They score three more runs. They go on to win the game five to nothing. The only complaint that I would have against Yost is, and, and I timed this. I went out after the game and, and timed it. I went back on my, my DVR and watched Joe Buck says Wade Davis is starting to, to loosen up in the bullpen. They show him a quick little thing. He's stretching his arm. In 45 seconds, Yost comes out to the mound and then calls for Wade Davis. Davis maybe had one or two pitches, couldn't tell, in the bullpen before he comes out to the mound, takes his five warm-ups, and then he's put in the live action. He should have had Davis possibly warming up a little bit sooner than that. The only thing that I will say in Yost's defense, and I haven't heard yet, is it's possible Yost may have gone out to talk to Herrera after he gives up the two singles, first and second, nobody out, 2 nothing game. He goes out to talk to Herrera. Herrera could have possibly said, Coach, I'm done. I don't have it. I threw 30-something pitches two nights ago. I just don't have it anymore. I'm out of gas. Now, Yost is, again, I'm speculating on that. Now, Yost has to make the move. He just called up Davis, going to try to buy some time, maybe get one more batter, then bring in Davis. All of a sudden, he's got to bring him in a lot quicker than he than he wanted to. So uh, Yost forced to kind of scramble there. We don't know what that conversation on the mound was between Herrera and Yost. Um, but after you give up a single, uh, it's probably a good time that you want to start getting Davis uh, warmed up just in case you need him for an emergency and you got to put a fire out. Um, so that would be my only minor complaint against Yost. But listen, Yost did not cost this game. You couldn't bring Billy Butler into a game when the Royals had four base runners. They had four hits, no walks. Bumgarner was solid. And they had clutch hitting. The Giants came up big when it mattered. That was it. It was just one good team beating another good team. Yost did not blow this game at all. So sorry for the interaction there with the guy playing the music. I thought he wanted to watch. I guess he just wanted to screw around. He must be a Giants fan. Um, anyway, those are my thoughts. Game six and seven, Royals have a chance to win. Yes, absolutely they do. Jake Peavy and Tim Hudson. But here's the thing. They're going to have to beat Petit. That guy has been solid, and we're going to talk more about that at MissouriNet.com as we get ready for Game 6 and then hopefully Game 7 with the Royals and the Giants in the World Series. Thanks for watching us. Remember to check out more of my stuff at MissouriNet.com and on Twitter at Missouri Sports. Have a good one.